fancy version of that coin flip experiment, right? So you, you can really think of classification as you have a bag and it's full of two different classes. It's full of orange things and blue things like in the example we did last time. And then you see something about the particular thing you have. And you wanna somehow use that information about the thing you saw to update the probability that it was either an orange thing or a blue thing. So before you know anything, there's some probability, some prior probability, and then the Bayesian way of thinking says, you always imagine information as updating your probabilities about the universe. And last class we did this, uh, we did a couple of things. We did the kernel density estimation formula, but then we, at the very end, we did this linear discriminant analysis. And it's called linear discriminant analysis, even though there's Gaussians here on the board, uh, because it turns out the only thing that matters after some algebra is you get a sigmoid applied to this function. And so it's a sigmoid applied to this function, which is a difference of two quadratics. And if you assume that they both have the same variance, the quadratic, if you assume that the variance of the orange curve and the variance of the blue curve are the same, you have the difference of two quadratic equations that have the same constant in front of the x squared term. And so a miracle happens, the difference of two quadratic equations becomes a linear equation, and that is why we had this green line in between, which was the linear discriminant. So let me, let me open this guy up. So this is the algebra we did last time, and here is the formula. It's the sigmoid applied to this difference, and uh, it will subtract. I guess in the, in the mathematize, I accidentally forgot the two. There should be a two, a two here, two sigma squared. Okay. So, any questions or comments about uh, this thing from last class or, or, or the setup here in general because we're gonna do? So today is gonna be more, kind of going in more detail of different things you can do with these, these uh, Bayesian methods and we're gonna do an example hopefully at the end with the Titanic data set again um, to see that kind of thing. Okay, so first question, and this is something people say, okay, these linear, this linear analysis thing, at the end of the day you get this green line and the green line is the difference between the two things. Let me, let me set it up here so we can look at it. This is exactly what we had last class. Um, right now the kernel one is turned on. Let's turn off, turn off the kernel one and turn back on the Gaussian one. Here are the two curves. So the orange quadratic equation is the log of the probability density of the orange Gaussian and the blue curve is the log of the probability density of the blue Gaussian. And their difference is that green thing. And here is the observation. The blue, the orange and the blue curve are quadratics that have a vertex at the mean, right? They're exactly focused on the mean of the blue and the orange points. And so when you subtract them, you're gonna get a line and that line will be zero exactly in the midpoint. So if you look at where, they, where the two curves cross, it's exactly in the midpoint. And so their difference will be zero exactly at the midpoint. So this zero point is exactly at the midpoint between the two curves. And that means that really what we're doing is something kind of very simple, which is that we're really taking the middle of this guy, the middle of this guy, and we're just saying in the middle, the difference is zero. And we're applying sigmoid to that. Sigmoid of zero is 50%, right? Sigma, if you apply, if this difference is zero, and we go to our estimator and you do sigmoid applied to zero, you get 50%. So we're saying in the middle, it's 50%, it's exactly 50% um, right here. So it should be hopefully 50% 50, 50 unless I have something set wrong. Uh, okay, well it should be 50% in the middle, which it looks, it looks like approximately 50%. So we're doing very, something very simple. Everything on that side, if you're closer to the blue middle, you get assigned to blue. If you're closer to the orange one, you get assigned to orange. It really is just like a, a dividing line with 50% in the middle. And you might want to think about doing something a little more complicated. Maybe we want it to be a little closer to the blue or a little closer to the orange. And so the question is, could we take the setup we did last class and tweak something small, some, some reasonable looking change to kind of make, make the line go a little bit towards blue or a little bit towards orange? Can we control where it goes? Or are we stuck with this 50% thing? And I asked you in Mathematize, put in any ideas you have uh, there are no wrong ideas. Let's see, three people put in ideas. Let's see what the three ideas you guys had are. The three ideas. Uh, adjusting the mean. Okay, this is, this is a nice idea. So you could adjust the mean. So that would be kind of like, let's pretend we have extra blue points that are over here, right? And move the mean that way. Uh, 
So this would be kind of like saying, I guess we don't want the, the, the value mu we use wouldn't represent the real data. And at that point, I think things start to get a little confusing. So I, I still want the mean that I use to represent the, the mean of the data. And then I can really talk about estimating the mean and use all the methods from statistics to estimate the mean and so on. Um, but I want a way to leave the mean the same, but somehow have the effect of the mean be different. So I want to leave the mean where it is. Um, that's, a good, that's the right kind of idea. I want to simulate what would happen if we move the mean, but still leaving the mean there. All right. Let's think of other ideas. Where other ideas? Uh, discriminant analysis. This whole thing is called discriminant analysis. So this idea, this green line is called the discriminant, and the discriminant tells you to assign to blue or to red, or to blue or to orange. And normally you say if it's bigger than zero, it's going to be blue. If it's less than zero, it's going to be orange. And if you do the sigmoid of it, you get the probability. So we need a way to move the discriminant. That that's what we're asking. If you want to think of fancy words like discriminant analysis, what I'm asking is, is there a way we could move the discriminant? Okay, uh, so here's one idea is to take a different variance for each of them. So in, in this simulation right now, we have the same variance for the blue and the orange. And if we change the variance of the blue and the orange, then these quadratic equations, the blue and the uh, orange quadratic equation will change, and then their difference will change. So let's see what that looks like. And we can just simulate that very simply because inside the Gaussian density estimates, we have two parameters. We have, uh, did I call it R? We have R0. Normally, you call it S for uh, standard deviation. But S was used somewhere else. So it's called R because R is the letter that comes after S. And I can change it for both of them by, with this slider. For R, that makes them the same. And you can see that changes the slope of the line. But I can also change it individually by making R0 something else. So why don't I make R0? Uh, I think this is the blue points. Let's make this uh, twice as big, twice as big. So now the blue one, if the variance is twice as big, and now you see it spread out, and look at what happened to that green curve, right? The place where they intersect, where the blue quadratic equation meets the orange quadratic equation, has moved away. It's moved closer to the orange points. And so the whole green curve moved, the whole thing shifted over this way. And if I make it even bigger, you know, I can, I can do it like that. And then you get a very different answer. So if we plot what the, uh, what the uh, estimate is, you get something totally different looking, right? So the, the difference of the two equations is no longer a line. Now it's just a quadratic equation. And the classifier is the sigmoid of that green quadratic equation. And it looks like this. Now you have a very funny looking thing, right? So now the classifier is saying, almost everything is blue. I think all these points are blue. If you see a point way over here, it's still blue. It's just that if you're in this little neighborhood, then, then I classify you as orange. So this definitely moved things over, but it also did a bunch of other things. And it did maybe things that we don't want to do. So for example, I find this highly suspect that it's assigning this whole region of space over here is the classifier says this is blue. I think these points are blue. Uh, even though there's one orange point here, and even though we've never seen a negative blue point, all the blue points have had positive x values. So this changing the variance definitely has an effect. It will definitely move things around. It'll change a lot of different things. Um, and we are gonna look at this in a little more detail um, before. Very roughly speaking, the reason it's assigning this entire region of space to blue is we have told the computer that blue points are very spread out and orange points are very narrowly focused. So if you see a point way over here, if you see a, a point way over here, it's way more likely to be a blue point than an orange point because the orange points are tightly focused here and the blue points are really spread out. So how can it be that we saw a point way over here? Well, it must have been a blue point that's very spread from its mean, not an orange point because those are tightly focused. So we, we've, we've changed something. Um, and so this will change a lot of things. This is called quadratic discriminant analysis and we'll get to this one in a little bit. So it definitely changes things, but I wanted something even simpler. I wanted something even simpler. Um, so let, let's change things back uh, to, to the way it was. I think we can do something where we keep the, the variances the same. We can change something else about our setup to move this thing, just very simply move it left and right. As you want, anybody else have any other ideas now that we've had a little bit of warm up and discussion? Yeah. Can it possibly use base? 
what do you want to do to this? So we have that green function, which is the, the discriminant. Let me plot the green function again. What do you want to do to it? Uh, I want to apply Bayes to the original function that we have. You want to apply Bayes. That's what, that's what this formula is, right? Okay, yeah, I think you're on the right track here. So this is what we had last time. Um, you want to apply Bayes to it. Weights, weights. Weights, okay, weights, okay, great. So what weights do you want to apply? What does that mean, apply weights? This is, this is, the, this is essentially the idea I'm going for, uh, if you can tell me what the weights are. Okay, so like like add on a constant here, or like multiply them by con. Yeah. Ah, okay. So if you multiply them by a constant, this is a great idea. Let's let's do a a W B and a W O. If you do a W B and a W O, the weight of the blue and the weight of the orange, that is effectively changing the variance of each, right? Because the W B divided by sigma squared is multiplying the whole thing, and the W O times sigma squared is multiplying the whole thing. So Doing weights, like you said, if you multiply by some weights, that is exactly the same as changing the variance of each of them. Um, so it will, it will exactly have the same effect as what we just saw of just changing the variance. That's if you multiply by the weights. But there's something, even before, when you're a child, before you learn multiplication, you learn something even simpler than multiplication. Additional. Addition. So instead of multiplying, you could just add a constant. Let's just add a constant. So we can add a weight. So um, let's do plus WB. So let's do plus WB. So the weight now is an additive weight, not a multiplicative weight. And let's do it for both to be symmetric. Um, plus W. Oh. All right. So what happens if you add weights? Well, you take the linear function. That linear function it had a 0 exactly in the midpoint. And you have taken that linear function and you've shifted it up and down by this weight function, wb minus w0. So what does it look like? It looks like, uh, let's go back to the thing. It'd be like you take this green function and you shift it up and down. Let's artificially do that. Let, let, me, let me do a little bit of hacking here to make it do that. Uh, where, where do I want to go? It's Gaussian density base. So here is the formula. Uh, here is the thing with the sigmoids. Okay. Here, yeah, okay, great. So this is the likelihood of the blue points. This is the likelihood of the uh, orange points. Those are the quadratic equations. This is their difference. This is the sigmoid function, and this is the sigmoid function of the difference, that green curve. Okay, so, so all you're telling me is, look, let's add on a constant here. Let's add on, I'm gonna call it W for weight. Add a slider for W. When W equals zero, it's exactly what we had before. But then let's see what happens if I change W. I can slide this up. And you can see the green classifier changes. And I can make it negative or positive if I want to go towards, towards blue or towards green. So let me turn these off. That's the, the classical thing. You can, you can go like this and just slide it up and down. And sliding it up and down is, is kind of equivalent to moving it left and right. And then you can change the classifier. You can make it anything you want. OK. This might seem really artificial. You're just like throwing in a weight. Like you just made some stuff up, right? I was like, I wanted to do something, and you throw in a weight. What if I told you this idea of adding a weight is already baked into our whole thing? We already had this weight. We don't even need it. So let me delete this, and I will, I, we can do the exact same thing by doing something different, uh, which is we can change in our thing. There is one other slider that was already there, and that is the prior probability. We said. Before, when we did our calculation, we said, let's make it 50% blues and 50% oranges. Remember, we had these one-half terms that were 50% blue and 50% orange. We said half the prior probability, when we take them out of the bag, before we look at the x values, we said 50% of the points are blue, 50% of the points are orange. And that is implemented in this little slider over here, q. So when q is 50%, it looks like that. What happens when we change the slider for q? Look at that. You see how it's moving? And it moves, it moves very slowly in the middle, but then when you get really close to one or, or, or zero, it moves very quickly. So it's moving, 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 moving. If you make it 0.9, let's make it 0.999, it'll move even more. And it'll 99, the more nines you add, the closer it moves over. So you can make it move left or right by just changing the prior probability. So right now, what I'm doing, as I'm doing a classifier, if Q is 0.9999999, that is saying, I think the points, most of the points are blue. Before we, we, when we pull something out of the bag, 
it's going to be a blue point. Before I even look at it, I'm 99.99999% sure it's a blue point. And then we look at the, the value, is it heads or tails? We look at the x value, and we update our probability. And when we see something like negative two, then we're like, okay, you know, we were 99% sure it was a blue point to begin with, but then we saw the value negative two, and now we're thinking, okay, well, we saw a negative two, and even though it was 99% to be a blue point before, now with this new evidence of seeing the value negative two, we have updated our probability and it's still very likely to be an orange point. And so by changing the prior probability, you can move the slider left and right. If you see something that is like zero, then that is not enough evidence to sort of overcome the prior probability. But if you see something like negative two, it is enough to overcome. And by changing this, you can do everything in between. So you can go the other way, you can make this 0 0.00001, and now you have a slider that's very close to the blues. You're saying, I really think that most of the points are orange to begin with. And by changing this, you can go to everything in between. Let me show you now mathematically, this is exactly the same as adding the constant. If you do the weight, if you add on the weight, w equals the log of p over 1 minus p, changing the value of p, the prior probability for one or the other, is exactly the same as adding this constant on. And that is because we had the formula our formula, okay, our formula is p times e to the minus uh, x. Okay, let's, let's do it in black to be fair to the orange points who don't like blue. Okay, e to the minus x minus one of them squared, divided by sigma squared, and then it was p times e to the minus, same term again, over sigma squared, plus one minus p e to the minus x minus mu o squared divided by sigma squared. So this is the exact same formula we had before, but before it was a half, and there was a half everywhere, and it all canceled out, because a half equals one minus a half. A half and its complement are the same. But if, if you use p and one minus p, what happens? Well, they don't cancel out. Now when you do the division, you divide, uh, divide top and bottom, divide top and bottom, and bottom. What do you get? So on the top, you still get a one. This term and that term are the same, you still get a one. You still get the difference of, of squares, so the exponential of the same difference, mu b uh, over sigma squared squared uh, plus x minus mu o squared divided by sigma squared. That was exactly what we had last time. And before, it was just multiplied by a factor of one. Now it will be multiplied by a factor of one minus p divided by p. So there's a constant, one minus p divided by p multiplying the exponential. And I can take a one minus p over p as a multiplicative factor on the outside, and I can put it inside the exponential by doing a logarithm. So this is exactly equal to one over one plus the exponential of exactly what we had before, x minus mu b squared divided by sigma squared plus x minus mu o squared divided by sigma squared. And then you have to add on exactly what I said or I guess subtract, if it, you want it to be exactly what I said. Uh, well, let's add it on for now. Log of one minus p divided by p. So you've taken the value of p, and it's just getting added inside the sigmoid function, and it will shift the linear discriminant up or down. And you can always do this. This, this whole fact actually did not rely on the fact that these were linear, right? This could have been, these could have been two different sigmas, and it still would have worked. By changing the value of p, you're just adding a constant to the discriminant, you're just moving, moving it up and down. Okay, so right, so the, this is sigma, or, or maybe it's one minus sigma of the stuff before. Uh, all right, difference of quadratics, of quadratics, that was what we had before. And now there is this new term, the log of one minus p over p, which we did not see before because it was zero before. Before one minus p and p were both a half, it completely canceled away. Okay, so very good, we know how to shift it. You know how to shift it. Uh, you might be asking right now, okay, why, why do we care about shifting? Is it just like making stuff up? Um, but I'll tell you a very good reason in a second. Question first. Yeah, so how do you add the, uh, the probabilities inside the equation? Like, can you explain the last derivative? Oh, uh, the step going from, from this line to that line? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I wrote one minus p over p. I write that as e to the power of the log of one minus p over p, because any number is e to the log of that number. And then I have e to the something times e to the something else. 
And when you multiply two exponentials, you're adding the exponents. So it became a plus over here. Yeah, no, great question. Anyone else? Okay, so why do I care so much about this? The reason is, in real life, you very often want to tune this, this prior probability p to get the best possible result you can. And the best possible result you can sometimes will be, we'll say, I want more oranges, and sometimes we'll say, I want more blues. And you want to be able to go in between and find the right balance. And I came up with a very nice example by Googling and copying it from Google. So, so here is the nice example. And it's the boy who cried wolf. So has everybody heard the story of the boy who cried wolf? Put your hand up if you've heard the story. Put your hand up if you have not heard the story of the boy who cried wolf. Okay, so I will tell you guys the story. This is like the kind of story I tell my son, uh, and I will tell you now. So once upon a time, there was a shepherd, and he was in the mountains, and he was guarding all his sheep, uh, okay? And when he was bored, he was just sitting there all day. He's like, you know, this is kind of boring. So let's do something fun. Let's have a laugh, and I'm going to pretend that there's a wolf. So he said, wolf, 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 and he runs down to the village, and all the villagers are like, oh my god, there's a wolf. And so they get their pitchforks, and they run up. They run up to the mountain to defend his sheep, and they get there, and there's no wolf. And then the shepherd says, ah, ha, ha, I tricked you. It was so funny. All right. And then all the villagers are mad. Okay. Next day, same thing again. So the boy's sitting there, he's bored. He's like, you know what? That was pretty funny. Let's do that again. And so he says, wolf, wolf, wolf. And the villagers are like, oh my god, there's a wolf again. They get their pitchforks. They go back up. No wolf. Everybody's mad at the boy again. All right, next day, guess what he does? The same thing again. So he, he says, wolf, wolf, wolf. The villagers get mad at him. There's no wolf. Everyone's sad. On the next day, there really is a wolf. Okay, so a wolf really comes. And then the, the, he, the boy's like, oh my god, there's a wolf. And the villagers are like, you're just tricking us again. The last three days in a row, you said there was a wolf, and there was no wolf. And now you're doing it again. And then the sheep all got eaten by a wolf, and everybody was sad. Okay, so what's the moral of the story? is that if you cry wolf all the time, then nobody will believe you when there is a real wolf. And that is the example that the uh, people at Google came up with. So this is from the machine learning course at Google. And they say, you can imagine, imagine that you're the boy and you see an animal coming up to your sheep, right? But it's like kind of far away, like it's in the distance and you're not sure if it's a wolf or not yet, right? Maybe it's a wolf, maybe it's a friendly raccoon, you're not sure. So let's pretend that wolf is the positive class. So we're trying to say yes or no, is it a wolf? Wolf is positive and no wolf is negative. And when you're doing this, when you see an animal coming at your flock of sheep, you can either yell wolf and alert the whole village or you can choose not to. And there's two types of errors you can make here. So there is a false positive, which is in reality, there was no wolf. That's a false positive over here. So if in reality it's not a wolf and you yell wolf, 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 then you have falsely identified that it's a wolf, a false positive. So you said wolf, there was no wolf, and the villagers are angry, right? So just like in the story, in the story he was doing it because he was bored. In this one, he was really trying his best to get it right, and he made a mistake. He made a false positive, and the villagers are angry, okay? And that's bad. Why is that bad? You might say, okay, what's the harm? Well, the harm is the villagers will get annoyed, and they will stop coming to help him when there really is a wolf, okay? The other type of mistake you can make is maybe you see an animal and you say, oh, it's probably not a wolf, I'm fine. But if it turns out it is a wolf, then all your sheep will get eaten. That's a false negative. So when you falsely identify it as negative. So in that reality, the wolf really was there and the shepherd said, no wolf. And the outcome is the wolf ate all the sheep because he didn't run to the village in time. So there's two types of mistakes that can be made here. Either a false positive or a false negative. Of course, there are many other examples in real life. You know, you can imagine with medical testing, so there's false positive and false negative, again, Quite, quite different. Um, the true positive and the true negative are when you correctly identify what is going on and you have two different situations, right? So this is when you get it right uh, and both are good, right? So when a wolf really comes and the shepherd says wolf, then he's a hero. And if there is no wolf and he doesn't do anything, then everybody's fine. So those are good. And the question is, which is worse? Is a false positive worse or a false negative worse? And I will give you these options. So, uh, you have three options. Which one do you think is worse? Uh, false negative, false positive, or somehow they're both bad or, or something. Um, so tell me what you think, read the options, think about the story, and tell me what you would do if you're, the, you're making a, pretend you're a data scientist making a machine learning algorithm that, that says, is that animal in the background a wolf or not? How would you think about these two rates?
Okay, maybe I should start it. I, I just realized I never started a timer, so probably you guys will never finish. Okay, let me, <laughs> let me do a timer. Let's do, uh, I don't know, 15 more seconds because it's already been a little bit. Okay. Okay, let's take a look. Which one is worse? All right. Okay, so nobody voted for false positive is worse. You should make the false positive rate as small as possible. So a false positive is when uh, you accidentally alert the villagers and they're annoyed, right? So in the false positive case, what's the consequence? People are annoyed at you. This, you know, people get annoyed for all sorts of reasons, so that's really not that bad. So I agree that nobody chose this one. That, that is a good, fine choice. On the other hand, we have a nine to nine vote split on false negative is worse, and you should balance the two rates. So I will let you, of course, if there's a tie, we must revote. I will let you think again. This time, feel free to discuss with your neighbors. What do you think we should do? Do you think we should try to make this as small as possible? Right? Try to make our machine learning algorithm have a small, as small as possible false negative rate, or should we try to do some kind of balancing and balance this with that. So I think we all agree this one is worse. The question is, is this one worse and we should make it as small as possible or should we find some kind of balance between the two things, even though that one isn't quite as bad? Okay, and I will let you re-vote. Feel free to discuss. Well, it's always fun when we get a split. Uh, Okay, uh, so I opened it up, you have to re-vote. I did only have 10 seconds left, but maybe I didn't warn you guys with enough time. So let me, let me bump it up to 30 seconds to put in your, uh, your final thing. You, you must re-vote, even if you didn't change your mind. Okay, let's take a look. Time is up. Let us see what people said. Reveal counts. Okay, one, one person switched. And we're still, we're still evenly split eight to eight. So thank you for the person who switched to make the drama as intense as possible on the perfect uh, split. Does someone wanna argue for one side or the other side? It seems both sides are equally popular. Yeah. yeah so if we can Wait, first of all, which side are you on? This one? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, tell us why. Yeah, so if we look at the worst possible outcome, for the false positive, yeah. it means the villagers will be annoyed, which is not that significant. But if we right. look at the false negative, it means our sheep or our right. livestock is getting affected. Right. But because of that, if I balance it out, I'll be you know less uh, you know biased towards false negative, which I don't want, because yeah. uh, false negative uh, predictions yeah. Okay. So let me let me summarize what I think you said, and you tell me if there's something I'm missing. So you're saying, look, if we were going to convert these into like a monetary value, 
the false negative is way, way worse. So like we could say the false negative is negative $10,000 every time we make that mistake because our sheep get eaten and we have to go buy new sheep or, or maybe we just starve it to death or whatever, right? Like let's give it a number, negative 10,000. Whereas this one, the false positive, is like negative one dollar. Like the people are annoyed if we just like paid them a dollar, then they would be happy at, with us again. They're like, oh, sorry, here's your money. Like, uh, come back next time. Um, so the false positive is really, really a lot less worse than the false negative. And then what was the last bit? And then you said therefore or what? Yeah. So for that reason, so I, I mean, yeah. rather than balancing out, I would yeah. first prioritize false negative. Right. So yeah, so because this one is so much worse, let's just make this one as small as possible. Yeah. And then that will, because this one is so much bigger, that will be the overall best yeah. thing. Got it, okay. Does anyone have an argument for the other side that you should balance them out? Yeah. Okay, so sorry, let me let me summarize what I think I understood from you. So you're saying we're machine learning people, we're data scientists, we're like proper uh, science folk, and we don't care if it, if one of them costs a dollar and the other one costs ten thousand dollars. Our job is to get the most right, right? We want to be as accurate as possible. That is our job. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think your first point. Okay. Right. So yeah, I think we I think we all agree with the 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 false negative is much worse. What is what do you mean by statistical power? What does that mean? Uh, I mean the, the first half, uh, the results we always see for mm -hmm. uh, we try to push it at a higher level. Uh huh. Rather the the output is being more uh, efficient. I see. Anybody else? Yeah. The second option also is worse. Uh, this one. The second one. Oh, this the false positive is worse? Yep. Okay. Uh, if you consider weights or any like negative things that are efficient before yeah. the false negative, if you yeah. don't have the false positive for the first two, then that will not work. Yeah, okay, this is a great one. So so this is a, a fantastic point. It it's certainly whatever we come up with today, it's not gonna be true that false negative is always worse. Because, for example, we could have labeled them backwards, right? Like right now we're talking, we said wolf is positive and no wolf is negative, which kind of logically makes sense. But you could easily imagine, like, it's flipped, right? We could, we could say no wolf is positive, because it's positive news, there's no wolf today, uh, and, and wolf is negative, and then everything would be flipped, right? So whether or not a false positive is worse than a false negative is somehow to do with the label of which one was positive and negative in the first place. So we're definitely not trying to say that false negative is always worse. We're saying for this particular setup with this particular uh, thing and in this particular universe with the wolf and so on, what is the case? And in some cases, maybe it'll be equally balanced. In some cases, maybe it'll be like really asymmetrical the other way. Um, so of course, fal false positive is not always worse or something. Uh, we wanna argue about this case in particular. All right. Uh, does anybody else have an argument for this balancing? Anybody else? There were, there were eight people who voted for it. Yeah. So I don't understand the importance of making a false negative as small as yeah. possible. Yeah. But if you look at the cost of making one small as good as possible, right. so how is that going to increase the model? Uh -huh. Because there is a little added one for false positive then. So you want to only focus on false negative. So I, I see. So it's so really important to balance it out. So you can trust the program or the model, uh -huh. but you don't have to you know, doubt your own. I see. Okay. This is a great, let me, I think there's one key nugget that I really liked in what you said. And I think you were, you were getting at the idea that, look, this would be so nice if we could make the false negative as small as possible. But you're saying that's not free. There is, there is a cost to making the false negative as small as possible, which is that in your model, practically speaking, when you try to make this as small as possible, you're accidentally going to make that one bigger. Yeah. Right? So you cannot just make the false negatives smaller for free. You can make the small negatives smaller for costs and the false positives, and eventually the, the cost will be too high to pay. 
Like, and that is why we gotta worry about balancing them. You should think about both, and you should think about balancing them in the way that you decide, but you cannot just make this one as small as possible for free. You have to worry about that one. And I will give you a very extreme example for this. I can come up with a machine learning algorithm, uh, a very fancy machine learning data science algorithm that has a false negative rate of zero. Zero, it never ever makes a false negative rate. Never, not even once, will it ever have a false negative. Do you know what that algorithm is? You just yell wolf every day, all right? Every day, you just yell wolf. There's a wolf today, there's a wolf today. Everybody, everybody come. And that way, for sure, on the day when the wolf comes, it is a day where I yelled wolf, right? So can it ever happen that a wolf is coming and I said no wolf? No, I'll never, that'll never happen because I just yell wolf every day, okay? So that is a false negative rate of zero. I made the false neg negative rate as low as possible. I made it literally zero. Is that a good outcome? Is that a good machine learning model? No, it is not because the false positive rate is so high that the villagers, not only do they get angry and annoyed, they stop coming to help me, right? That is the point of the story, is that you cannot, if this false positive rate is too high, then on the days where you need them to come defend you from the wolf, then you need to make sure that they are not annoyed with you, okay? So it, you cannot just make this as small as possible. You do need to have some kind of balance. Did I put that in the, uh, in the, in the answer? Yes, I did, okay, great. So you should balance it, and that is always the reason. You can always make these rates zero or one, but then you end up with a terrible rate on the other side. Uh, to get back to your point, I think you made an excellent point, is that we said at the beginning of the class, or at the beginning of our thing on classification, we said classification, your objective function, your objective function we said was accuracy. Um, so we said, we said we're trying to maximize the accuracy. That is what we do when we do a machine learning model. And our accuracy is equal to uh, the number of false positives. Actually, it's really just the number of false divided by the number, the total number. The total number. Okay, that's not the accuracy. That's one minus the accuracy. The, the, uh, the accuracy is a 100% minus all the ones we get wrong. Uh, so if we make something and we're wrong, that's a false something, either a false positive or a false negative, and we divide by the total number. And this can be written as one minus the false positive rate, false positive, uh, let's say rate, uh, minus the false negative rate. Okay, so from uh, the point of view of accuracy, what you're really doing is you're balancing them in a very specific way, which is you're balancing the sum. You want to make the sum of this plus this. If you want to be as accurate, in quote, as possible, and get the most number right, then you are doing this plus this. So if somebody says, I'm trying to maximize the accuracy, that means they're trying to make the sum of the false negatives and the false positives as small as possible. That is their balancing choice. And you could say, okay, well, look, I, you told me at the beginning of the chapter, accuracy is the most important thing. And I think the, the moral of the story is that if your goal is to get as many right as possible, that is accuracy. But in real life, your goal might not be accuracy, right? Your goal might be uh, average, average dollars lost. That might be the real thing. Like if you work at a company, they don't care how often you get it right or wrong, they care how many dollars is it gonna cost me. And if there's a big asymmetry between a false positive and a false negative, so for example, if we say it costs us $10,000 every time we get a false positive, because false positives are bad, um, and it costs us one dollar every time we get a false negative, uh, then, then this is our new objective function. And now we have one of them is 10,000 times bigger than the other one, which can happen in real life if the consequences for one or the other are very different. Okay, so it is important to know, uh, yeah, this is like part of being a good machine learning data scientist engineer is to know what the algorithms do and when is it that they do something other than what you really wanna do. And in fact, I think this is most of the job, right? This is why we're telling you what the algorithms do in a lot of detail and not just saying, go run the thing and, and don't think about it too hard. We're saying think about it a lot because in real life, they often do something other than what you want to do. Um, okay, so why are we telling you all this? This all goes into something called the ROC curve. The ROC curve. Because the pen, the pen no longer works. Okay, let's try what's happening. Kind of work now, okay. Um, so the ROC curve, ROC curve, and ROC has a very funny name. 
It, it stands for, I think, receiver operator characteristics. And this was invented during like World War II where the receiver operator was like somebody who got in the radar signals and was like shooting at planes and stuff. Uh, really what it should be called is uh, false negatives versus false positive curves. Negative versus false positive, positive uh, comparison curve. That would be a better name. And it really, it shows you in what way can you trade off false positives for false negatives? False negatives and false positives. So in the plot, there are two axes. Let me make sure I get the axes right. I don't want to get them wrong. Oh my god, sensitivity. Don't, it is true the two axes are sensitivity and specificity, but nobody knows what these words mean. So don't ever use these words because it's very confusing. They ha these have a specific meaning that is something like one of them is the true positive, one of them is the false positive, but which is which, nobody will ever know. Okay, so um, I believe... Uh, it is a plot, let me, let me do it like this. On the, on the x-axis, we put in the false positive, positive rate, rate, rate. Okay, false positive rate. And on the, the x-axis, we put in the true positive rate, the true positive rate. Okay, and so what this is saying is in this receiver operator characteristic curve, the ROC curve, we are going to look at not um, true positives versus false positives, which can go up and down. We're going to look at something that is monotone increasing. We're going to look at uh, the true positives versus the false positives. So we're going to compare this, this box to this pop box. And the reason it's nice to compare to this box to that box is there are a lot of points that are easy to label. And one of them I've already talked about is over here. So this is a false positive rate of zero. Uh, false positive. I guess I guess the way I was doing it, it was negatives. Okay, so I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a version with negatives because that is more interesting for our wolf problem. So this is the ROC for negatives, uh, and I guess classically it is for the positives, but we're gonna make it for negatives. So let's cross this out: the tr the true negative rate and the false. Now I'm confused. Hold on, false positive is that one. Oh no, okay, well, let's leave it the way it was. I, I'm being silly, let, let, me, let me undo. Okay, we're gonna compare these two rates. All right, ROC curve. So a false positive rate of zero, that is the algorithm that I told you before. That is the algorithm always, always yell wolf, no matter what. Every single day we always yell wolf, the false positive rate will be zero. When you do this, the downside of doing this very silly algorithm of always yelling wolf is that the true positive rate is always zero. The true positive rate is, uh, no, wait, wait a second. If you always yell wolf, where are you? Okay, you say wolf, you say, you say wolf. Okay, now, now I think I just have the axes wrong. Well, let's, let's do a Google search. ROC curve, what is on the ROC curve? Here we go. All right, true positive rate versus false positive rate. That is exactly like I said. Maybe I'm on the other end. Here, here is a nice, a nice pic picture. True positive rate, false positive rate. What do I have? False positive rate, true positive rate. Okay, so if the false positive rate is zero, <laughs> maybe there is a mistake somewhere else. Maybe, I'm just being silly. Okay. Okay, so if you always yell wolf, it should be zero, zero. Why is the true positive rate zero, I guess? Maybe I'm confused by something. Maybe I have the other point. Does anyone see what I'm doing wrong here? True positive is when a wolf comes and I say a wolf comes. Ah, okay, look, I, I was reading the wrong thing. This, this corner says false negative. You see, there's your problem. I was reading this one. When you yell wolf every day, it's not that you never have a false positive, it's that you never have a false negative, okay? You will never ever make the big mistake of the false negative if you yell wolf every day. You will very often, uh, right, every day you're yelling wolf, you will actually make a huge number of false positives because you're yelling wolf every single day. And so the, the algorithm I said is not this point where the rates are zero. The algorithm I said is this point where the rates are 100%, 100%. Um, so this is yell wolf every day. There's your problem, okay, great. Yell wolf every day. And when you yell wolf every day, two things happen. 
First of all, you never ever make a false negative. So your false positive rate uh, is, is of things where you got, where it's positive, you always said it was, uh, it's 100%. So let's see. Yeah, so if you yell wolf every day, you're always in the top row here. And so you will never ever make a mistake of having a false negative. So your, your false positive rate is 100%. Of mistakes, it's always a false positive. Of real life things, you will get these ones correct, right? When a wolf really does come, you're a hero because you yelled wolf every day. But you will never make this kind of thing, right? And so your rate is 100% for true positives as well. So this is the 100%, 100%, 100% uh, spot. False. So 100% false positives and 100% true positives. Uh, true positives. So when you get it right, you're 100% in the true positive camp. And when you get it wrong, you're 100% in the false positive spot. So we draw this. This is the point 100%, 100% uh, on the axis. OK. There is an opposite spot over here. This is the 0, 0 spot. Does anyone, can anyone describe what that strategy would be? So in this one, I'm never making the other kind of mistake. In this problem, it's a bit silly. Because we know that you you know want that yelling. We know that this one is is bad, and we're, so we're making sure you know it's kind of silly to do this. But well, yeah, what, how would you describe it? I heard somebody say, it. yeah. We will always say no wolf. We'll always say no wolf. So we never say wolf. So this one we never ever say wolf, no matter what. Um, and this is the never say wolf spot. And when you never say wolf, then what will happen is well you'll never annoy the villagers. The villagers will never be annoyed. Uh, but you will also never, never save your sheep on the day the wolf comes. So it's a 0%, 0%. It's that spot. OK. It turns out there is a nice, a very simple set of algorithms. And again, algorithms is putting it generously that do this line. This is the line y equals x, the perfect 45 degree line. Um, so for example, here, here is the 50%. Here's the spot 50%, 50%. And there is a very simple machine learning algorithm that achieves 50%, 50%. You guys know what that would be? Uh, regression? Uh, no, no, not regression. And this is an algorithm you can do in any situation, no matter what. Well, I'll give you a hint. It's somewhere halfway between never saying wolf and always saying wolf. What would be halfway between? Alternate days. Yeah, alternate days. Yeah, exactly. So on, on even number of days, I yell wolf. And on odd number of days, I, I yell no wolf. Or even better, I flip a coin every morning. If it comes with heads, I yell wolf. If it comes with tails, I yell no wolf. And then for sure, you're going to be at the 50%, 50% spot. Because uh, you know, on a day when the wolf comes, if the, if the coin came up heads that morning, then you're going to get it right. And if the coin came up tails that morning, you're going to get it wrong, and vice versa if there's no wolf. So it's very easy to get 50%, 50%. In fact, you can get any, any combination you want by doing, you know, you can have a 25% coin. So that's 25%, 25%, and so on. So this is why this graph is nice, is you can easily see these sort of dumb strategies and how they operate. There are this diagonal line. And every other algorithm under the sun will be somewhere on this graph, because it'll make some number of false positives, it'll make some number of true positives, and it'll be somewhere on the graph. You would hope that it would be above this line. So this is better. This above here is better than chance, than chance. So if you have an algorithm, that is somewhere in this top corner, then you are doing better than just flipping a coin randomly. And I'll give you the, the perfect algorithm is this. This is the perfect, this is the perfect algorithm, is this top corner um, in, in the top. OK. The perfect algorithm is all the way in the top corner. Uh, so that has a false positive rate of 0. You never make a mistake of a false positive. And it has a true positive rate of 100%. So you always get it right, and you never get it wrong. This is a perfect algorithm in the, in the corner. In real life, you will not get a perfect algorithm because there's always random noise. There's things like that. You will not get it perfect even if you have the perfect algorithm. Um, and so in real life, what does a curve look like? It looks like some, some well, one single algorithm is one point on here. So one single point, um, I'm running out of color. Let's do orange. So one algorithm might be over here. This is like a real life algorithm. And this has a false positive rate of some amount, and it has a true positive rate that's higher. right? that you get it right more often than you get it wrong, your accuracy is better than 50%. Um, OK. 
Why did we, how did we start this? How did we get to this topic? Remember, we were talking about the one nice thing about these Bayesian methods is that you can slide by changing the prior probability, you can slide around the decision boundary. And when you slide around the decision boundary, you are changing the rate of true positives and false positives. So imagine orange is the positive class. If we set it way over here, in fact, if I make it zero, then this is the algorithm. I always say it's orange. My, this is the algorithm of always or never triangle, right? Um, you get it 100% right. And if I go the other way, it's the opposite one. And when you go in between, you get a whole family of algorithms just by changing this one parameter. You get a one parameter family of algorithms that connect this point of never saying wolf to always saying wolf. And so you're, you, what you're gonna get is for every single algorithm, you get a different point. And so you can imagine what's gonna happen is you connect the dots as you slide that Q parameter around, you get a curve that looks like that. And this curve is exactly the curve that when people talk about the ROC curve, that is the curve. And it somehow captures how well you can distinguish false positive from true positive. And if you know the trade-off, if you say, I want to minimize, I want um, the average number of dollars lost to be 10,000 times worse for a false positive than a false negative, that is something like, please find the intersection of this line and the line uh, which has slope 10,000. So this is the line with slope 10,000, or something like that. Um, and you find where they intersect, and that's the, the optimal thing. Uh, I, I will maybe leave that as an exercise. So if you know the objective function and you know the receiver operator characteristics curve, you can come up with what is the right place to tune it. Um, okay. Uh, so that is the ROC curve. And another thing you need to know about these ROC curves, so they kind of capture how does the algorithm do as you change the trade-off from one to the other? Um, and one way you can easily measure that is you can look at the area under the curve. So this is called the AUC. If you see AUC, this is a, one of my favorite acronyms, area under curve. So this is like a child could understand what area under curve is. You measure the area under this curve. Okay, uh, let, let's highlight it so that it's not so... Invisible, right? And the bigger the area you have, if you have a perfect algorithm, that'll be 100%. Um, and if you have an imperfect algorithm, it should hopefully be more than 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is the family of always doing random guesses. Uh, and somehow that tells you typically how is it doing. It's, it's kind of a measure of how good are you at balancing never crying wolf with always crying wolf. How well can you get that balance? Okay, so different, this is one way to compare this is a nice metric to compare, to compare two algorithms. Compare two algorithms. You could compare their area under the curves. So you make this curve. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments so far about this thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, is that backwards for the wolf? No, I, uh, I'm not sure about the question. Yeah. In real wolf, the false positive has more pass than false negative? In the real world, it 100% depends on the situation. So if, in, in the example we just did, I think that is a perfectly valid real world example, in quotes, right? Like, imagine, all right, I'll, let's, make it, let's make it more, if you want it to be more serious, instead of a wolf, imagine there's a camera and it's pointed at the sky, and it detects if a missile is coming. And then there's like, if it is a missile, then we like shoot our missiles at it. And if it's not a missile, we do nothing. Then it's a lot worse to say there is a missile. Uh, if, you, if you miss a missile, that's really bad, because then the missile comes and blows up your city. So like, this is a real, perfectly valid real life example where I think it is very asymmetric, and you gotta make sure your algorithm will never, like you gotta, you gotta balance in this way that you really like make sure the false positives are highly accounted for as being super bad. There's other situations where it's completely flipped. Like in medical testing, if you give a false positive, then like, oh, somebody like thinks they have the disease, but they actually don't have it. That's not so bad. Then like later on they discover, oh, it was actually fine and they're like relieved. Okay, so they were, again, that, in that situation, that person is merely annoyed. Um, so it 100% depends on the real life situation. And I guess the important thing to know in your data science class is that 
you sort of decide what to do. When you're putting it in the computer, part of what you're doing is that is the moment in your brain where you have to use your intuition as a human as to which is worse and assign numbers to it and somehow incorporate that into your machine learning algorithm. Because otherwise, the machine learning algorithm will just automatically treat them as the same and do accuracy or something, which is not true in a lot of situations. Yeah, great question. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so you can do this ROC curve and you can do that for, for any type of algorithm as long as you have a slider that you can change how much it's, it's rating things. And that, that's the nice thing about the, the, these Bayesian methods is that the slider can be the prior probabilities. So, so far, what have we done? A little summary. Um, so we're doing these Bayesian classifier methods. And the slider, the slider is the prior probability. So by changing the prior probability in the formula, you can get the entire ROC curve. I will say, uh, before that, we did logistic regression. Um, let me make that as a little aside. So when we do logistic regression, um, you can also get a slider, right? In logistic regression, we estimated the probability of one class or the other class, and you can make a classifier out of that by saying, I'm gonna classify it one way or the other way if it meets a certain threshold probability. So the slider is the threshold probability. So logistic regression really just estimates a probability, and then you say if it's greater, normally you say if it's greater than 50%, then I classify it as A. If it's less than 50%, I classify it as B. But that 50% can change. You can say I'm only gonna classify it as wolf if it's greater than 10%, right? If I think if there's a 10% chance there's a wolf, then I will yell wolf. And then that way, I'd be less likely to miss real situations of the wolf being there at the cost of more situations where the, the villagers are annoying. Um, so, so far we've done this Bayesian thing. What have we done with it? So, again, this is a very general idea, which is that the idea is very simple, is that it estimate the probability of x given y, given y equals class. So if you can figure out the probability of the observation given the class, then you can invert that, invert by Bayes' rule, invert by Bayes. Okay, and then you'll invert to get the probability of y is some class given x. And there are many ways you could do this first step. So this, this idea of estimating, you can do it in a number of ways. One way is kernel density estimation. That is what we did yesterday. Another way is uh, uh, linear, which is again a terrible name, linear discriminant analysis. What is linear about it? The thing inside the sigmoid is linear analysis. And in linear discriminant analysis, you pretend, uh, you, you say the density is Gaussian, and you assume the same variance. Assume same variance. Okay. That's what we've done so far. In the last little bit here, we're going to keep going and, and kind of make this more complicated. What are other ways you could estimate this probability? Well, the very first thing that was mentioned earlier in the class today and was the topic of the video is so-called quadratic, quadratic discriminant analysis. Discriminant analysis. And in this one, Instead of assuming they have the same variance, you can assume they have different variances. So use variance as a parameter. Okay. So it really is exactly the same thing, except in our formula, we're gonna, instead of just having a mean for the oranges, a mean for the blues, we're gonna have a mean and a variance for both of them. Okay, so what is that gonna look like? I'll show you a picture. And again, we did, we did actually do this earlier, so the picture won't be so surprising. Um, what do I need to do? I just go into here. So right now, R0, the variance of the blues and the variance of the oranges are the same, but you can make them any number you want. One thing you could do is you could estimate what this number is by looking at the blue points. Right? So you take the blue points, we've estimated their mean, that is how we came up with the, uh, uh, the center. You could estimate their variance by doing the sum of squares minus the mean, all that. Um, so you could change this to anything you want. Maybe it comes out to 0.5, and then it looks like that. And now you have a situation where there are two different widths. And this leads to this funny discriminant, where the discriminant, the difference of the things, 
is now a, uh, or should be, R0 is 0.5. We did this too. Uh, okay, maybe it's a quadratic, but I didn't make them different enough. Let's try again. Let's make this 2R. Two, two that was fun. Okay, yeah. So this leads to a situation where you get a quadratic equation and you have this funny dip that happens. So when you do the sigmoid, you end up with something like this. Uh, I find this, this is kind of hard to see in one dimension what's going on. So I mean, all the information is here, but it's sort of weird to see and like weird to think about. I think this one makes more sense if you look in two dimensions. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna show you the same thing in two dimensions in this 3D Desmos plot. So let me turn off all, this, all these things. Uh, turn everything off, please. Okay. So this is my first time using 3D Desmos, which is new and very exciting and apparently has crashed. Okay, no, <laughs> there we go. All right, look at, look at. So it's spinning and there is our, our thing. Uh, we can look at it like this, we can look at it like this. Okay, great. So to start with, we're gonna have some distributions, a blue and an orange distribution. And there you go. So that is a blue distribution and an orange distribution. So now we're thinking of the x values. There's two x values. And we're saying if you're an orange point, your value is likely over here. And if you're a blue point, your value is likely over there. And you can look at it from below, and it looks like that. So the orange points are more likely to be up here, and the blue points are more likely to be down there. If we did linear discriminant analysis, if it was linear discriminant analysis, then they would have the same variance, and so they would look like the same shape. So let's, let's do a linear discriminant analysis first. So let's set them both to S. Uh, is one of them missing? Ah, okay, there's your problem. S2 and orange. Yeah, there's a little typo that I should fix if it will let me. Okay, S1, okay, there we go. So in linear discriminant analysis, they are the same. And then if you plot the difference between them and take the sigmoid, you get a line, which is a linear function, and you do the sigmoid, then you get a nice classifier between them. Um, okay, and here is the classifier between them. That's the classifier, which you can see from the side is kind of splitting. If you look at it from the side, it looks just like our 1D example. But of course it's in 3D, so you can look at it like this. And so this like sheet is going in between the blues and the oranges, exactly on the hyperplane between the blues and the oranges, and it's splitting the x-axis sort of into two regions. One region where you classify towards an orange, one region where you classify towards a blue, and in between is kind of this plane where you go from 100% to 0%. And just like before, if you change the, the, the prior probability p, okay, you can move this left or right. So now I've moved it, so right, if, if I slide this, left or right, I can move where this uh, thing is. That's the prior probability. Okay, so that's linear discriminant analysis. Let's see what happens if it's quadratic, and all you have to do is change uh, the variance. So let's change the variance of the blue one. Let's look from the top, and yeah, let's change, turn off this classifier, and let's change the variance of the blue one. So let's make the blue one, just like before, let's make it have twice as much variance. So we have some orange points over here, but they're very close together. We have blue points kind of all around, and they're very spread out. And we, we could estimate these parameters, the variance and the mean, kind of separately. Um, okay, so we have orange points here kind of clustered. We have blue points here kind of spread out. Let's see what the classifier looks like now, because it really is much more complicated than a line. So here is the classifier, and it looks something like this. Okay, uh, actually, the opposite classifier is more fun. Let me, let me, make, a, let me make the the opposite classifier. How do I make the opposite classifier? Okay, I will, I will do this. I will make this guy have m the big variance. I'll have this guy have the small variance, okay. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so I, I switched it just for convenience. I made the orange points spread out and the blue points tightly centered. And now if you do the classifier, it is a nice bowl, look at this. So the plane, has become, the, the, the plane is most of the points I classify as orange, right? I have 100% probability to classify things that are very far away, except for there is a hole, there is this hole right where the blue is, right? So if, you're, if you give me a point that's directly in there, then I will classify it as blue, otherwise it gets classified as orange. 
which is to say if you see points that are far away, they, they were more likely to come from the orange distribution that was spread out than the blue distribution that was close together. Uh, and let's see what happens when you change the probability p, you also change the size of this hole. So if you can either make it smaller, right, that's saying I think points should be orange to begin with, or you can make it bigger by going the other way. And if you make it really small, you can get a nice big, a big hole, right? So, so there's a nice big hole that includes the points of high probability for blue. So that is a quadratic um, estimator in two dimensions. And this really, this surface is the sigmoid applied to a quadratic function, which looks very complicated. All right, any questions or comments so far? So again, same, same idea, just more complicated functions. All right, so this was in two dimensions. Right, x and, the x values were in two dimensions. You had an x1 observation and an x2 observation. It'd be like you get somebody and you observe their height and their weight or something, right? And now you might ask, okay, in real life, like you've seen in your project, you have like 80 dimensions, like 100 dimensions. So it is important to understand how do these methods scale as you add more and more dimensions. And so that is the, the topic of the last question we'll do in Mathematize today, uh, this one. Suppose you have data which is in d dimensions. So x is in rd, you just saw X is in R2, so that was the case D equals 2. And you are assuming that the data is a multivariate Gaussian. So you're going to draw a Gaussian for the blues, a Gaussian for the oranges, um, and we're going to not have any constraints that they're related, right? So before we were, for linear discriminant analysis, we said the same variance for both. For quadratic, we said different variances for both. I'm going to let you do any Gaussian you want under the sun, any Gaussian in D dimensions. So a multivariate Gaussian in R to D. And the question is, how many parameters would you need to estimate? How many parameters come with a Gaussian? Um, so how, how many parameters would you need to estimate from some data to get the orange or the blue distribution? And I think there's choices. It's a bunch of different formulas. Is it d? Is it d squared? Which of these is it? And I'll let you think for a few minutes. You can think about the case we did. How many possibilities were there? Things like that. Um, I'll give you guys like two minutes to come up with an answer. And we'll see what people think. Okay, 30 seconds left, but only four votes. Does anybody want more time, or you're just trying to pick between <laughs> the guys? Okay, let me, let me uh, bump it up to one minute.
Okay, let's take a look at what people said. I'm very curious. All right, eight people voted for D, three people voted for D times D minus one over two, uh, four people for the sum of those two things, and one each in these other ones. Uh, so let's talk about D. There are D parameters just to estimate the mean. This is one thing you should know. So uh, why are there D parameters just to estimate the mean? Let's make this thing stop spinning and let's turn off the classifier. You can move the mean around in two dimensions. So if I go like this, you can move the mean, you can move it up and down, right? So the mean has a mean of the Y coordinate, or I shouldn't call it the X, the Y coordinate. I should call it the X2 coordinate, right? So you have X1 and X2. The X2s can go up and down, and the X1s can go left and right. So there's two parameters just for what is the mean of this guy. There's two parameters for the mean. Um, so we're doing a little parameter, parameter count. Parameter count. Okay, so the mean has D parameters. Right? And that's because there really is a mean of x1, and there's a mean of x2, and all the way up to xd, the expected value of xd. Every single dimension has its own mean, and you can kind of slide them all independently. So that's d parameters. So there's at least d parameters. There are some other ones that are related to variance. Variance. How many variance parameters are there? How many variance parameters are there? Uh, so in this one, I made it look as if there was only one. I said, look, I have one slider, and you can make it bigger or smaller. That was just like we had before. You can make a peak, or you can make it spread out. So I made it seem like there's only one. But there is not only one. There is more than one. Does someone want to guess how many variance parameters are there? D minus one. Okay, why is there D minus one? Well, d minus 1, first of all, when d equals 2, like in our situation, would be your formula says 1. And I'm telling you there's more than one. So I, I'm missing one here. I haven't, I haven't fully done it. There's actually another, another way you can change the variance beyond just making it bigger or smaller. How else could you change the variance? So, so say you, let's look at the blue distribution thing. So right now, you make it bigger or smaller. What else could you do? Uh, yeah, multiplying by constant turns up does, does just make it bigger or smaller. So multi it, multiplying by a constant, if you take a vector x1 and x2 and you multiply it by a constant, then you multiply both components by that constant, right? So you do c times x1, x2 is cx1, cx2. Multiplying by a constant is exactly this. What else could you do to a vector other than multiplying it by a constant? What else could you do? So you, instead of multiplying the entire vector by a constant, what could you do? Adding, yeah, this is great, this is very good. Adding a constant is exactly moving this up and down. So if you add something to the y coordinate, or the x2 coordinate, I should say, then you move it up and down, right? If you add something to the x1 coordinate, you move it uh, this way, left and right. If you multiply the entire vector by a number, then you shrink it and blow it up, right? What else could you do other than multiply the entire vector by a constant? So, so far you've added to the x, x1, so you've added to the x2s, and then you multiply the entire thing by some constant c. Let me, let me give a hint. I'll give a hint by using a picture. Let's turn these ones off. So here's a fancy one that looks more complicated. Let me turn these off. Let me... Uh, a virtualized one. I set this to zero. Okay, there we go. This is what I want. Okay, so here is one, and here I'm going to do something different. What about this? So, actually, oh, will this animate? Oh, ho, ho. will it animate back? Okay. Okay. So it, it, when it gets too high, it uh, over overruns the page. But in this situation, I'm not scaling both axes. I'm scaling just one. 
And that is another thing you can do when you are in two dimensions. Nobody says that the variance in the x1 direction has to be the same as the variance in the x2 direction. So maybe I go out and I measure the height and weight of people, and people's, I don't know, weights are all over the place, but everybody is between five foot one and five foot three because of the, the sample of people I picked. So the variance of the x1 and the variance of the x2 can be different. And so there's actually at least d of these things. There's at least d of these things. Uh, there's d parameters for the variance of x1, the variance of x2, all the way up to the variance of xd. And they can all have their own individual variance. In the example I did before, I made them equal, just to make things simple. But they can actually be different. Am I missing any parameters on this list? So far, I have d means and d variances. I guess you'll find out next time in data 6100 uh, when we come back uh, on Tuesday's class. So we'll finish up. Are there more? You can think about it. Are there more? Are there more? Are there even more? Or is that all of them? Are there some other parameters that can get changed? Um, and understanding this is going to be crucial to understanding how our algorithm will scale up when we go from two dimensions to 81 dimensions. Is it going to get 81 times harder, or is it going to get 1,600 times harder? Right? It's going to it's going to make a difference. Um, okay. So that'll be next class. Uh, we I will probably make an announcement about moving the videos a bit. So the videos for next time we probably won't get to uh, until the class after. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, don't forget your uh, projects are due on Sunday. Um, and I think that's it. Okay.